morning, fellow humanists. My name is Todd Kimball, and it is an honor and a privilege to be your MC today. I'll tell you that it is a dangerous Sunday to have me be the MC when the Mariners have won 13 games in a row, and my San Francisco Giants have had the two victories they have had. But I will keep my baseball and life commentary to a minimum as we have a very exciting reader and speaker this morning. They are far more interesting than anything I will say. A reminder that humanism is a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art and motivated by compassion. It advocates the extension of participatory democracy and the expansion of an open society standing for human rights and social justice. Our reader today often entertains us with philosophy and math mathematics. I don't know what he has in store today, but I know it will be engaging. Please welcome our reader, Mr. Lawrence Beauregard. Good morning. Um, this, I was going to say this morning's reading is about baseball, but you'd all know that I'm kidding if I said that. Actually, what I have to offer this morning is a sermon uh, on secular morality. And I give this sermon with no Roman collar around my neck. Let's see what we think about this. The, the chief virtue of this reading is that it's extremely brief. So it's about morality. And morality is grounded in the fact of human suffering. Morality is also grounded in the fact of animal suffering. Being moral is about reducing suffering. Being moral has nothing to do with being pure. Morality has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with ideology. Suffering is something that all sentient beings experience. It's a fact of life. The primary goal of morality then must be to deal with suffering, suffering. Morality is also about promoting well-being, the well-being of all who are capable of comfort, all who can be happy, all who can feel good. Now, these ideas are based on reality. You can call them principles if you like. What matters is that they make sense. They make sense because of the physical suffering and the mental suffering that there is in the world. The point of morality, again, is to reduce suffering and to promote well-being. Again, nothing to do with purity, nothing to do with principles. Morality has to be grounded in reality. This, by the way, leads directly to the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And if you think about it, this golden rule leads directly to abstaining from eating meat. It leads directly to the abolition of factory farms, animal concentration camps in every sense of the word. The amount of suffering in those places is almost impossible to fully grasp. Now, it turns out that many humanists do not think this way. Many of us are what Peter Singer has called speciesist. I call it human chauvinism. This is something that's actually very much like racism. Let me explain. In the bad old days, there were ideas going around that were used to justify the enslavement of Black people. There was this notion that the suffering of Black people did not matter as much as the suffering of white people. Today, many of us think that the suffering of animals does not matter as much as the suffering of human beings. Now, this is worth looking at. This is worth thinking about. Critical thinking. It's about where morality comes from. But one thing for sure, simply dropping God from the morality equation is not enough. That's it. Thank you, Lawrence. A very thoughtful reading this morning. We have all come to humanism in different ways. A few of us knew of the humanist philosophy and structure from a young age. Others lived a humanist lifestyle, but didn't know it had a name 
and still others were raised in a religious environment and came to humanism later in life. Savria Hall falls into this category. A preacher's kid from the Bible Belt South, she faced difficulties in leaving dogmatic religious foundation to learning to stand in one own truth. It was during this personal journey where she realized there was a lack of support available to those experiencing religious trauma. In addition to therapy and co coaching, Sandria speaks and writes as an advocate for trauma healing. It is her goal to be a resource and safe place for others questioning belief or transitioning altogether. Let's have a warm yet muted welcome for those on Zoom and an enthusiastic greeting from those at the Friendly House for Sandria Hall. Hi there, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for spending some time with me this morning. Time is precious, so I don't take it lightly that you're here. Um, that you invited me here to spend some time with you, so thank you. <clears throat> as the introduction said, I am a um, religious trauma therapist as well as life transitions and they overlap quite a bit. And just wanted to share today a little bit about um, my story and my practice. And I'll begin similar to how I began a therapy session with my clients, um, which is usually something like, how did you meet Jesus? Because that was my brand of religion. And I met Jesus through my parents. We are from the Bible Belt South. My parents were raised in a small rural town in Alabama. And at about 16 years old, a traveling ministry came through and pitched a tent. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with tent meetings of the, <laughs> of the old days. They actually still happen, but um, a, a very charismatic husband and wife team showed up in my parents' hometown, pitched a tent, the sawdust floors, the, the makeshift uh, uh, stage, full band, amazing singing, um, just beautiful, um, courageous, um, black people. And this was a big deal because this was in the sixties. My parents came to know Jesus, um, 1968. This was the same year that George Wallace won Alabama's presidential election by landslide. So that gives you some indication of what was happening at that time. And for my parents, um, you know, segregation, and then integrate a very, very painful integration. What the church did for them was give them family. It gave them community. It gave them safety and purpose. Um, and that's what they passed on to me. It was the best they had to give. And that's what they passed on to me and my siblings. Now for me, I was 25 years old when I officially said yes to Jesus. Now I was raised in this, this holy roller, Pentecostal um, upbringing, but it wasn't until I was about 25 that I accepted Christ for myself. At this time, I had moved from Alabama to the Atlanta, Georgia area and joined this mega church, right? The huge <laughs> dome-like uh, congregations, thousands of people. And you know, similar to my parents where it answered a need for them, this mega church answered a need for me. I, you know, growing up, my parents honed in on um, being a good person, being involved in the community. I remember people living with us as they were in transition with my parents. Uh, we helped people get on their feet. I, I saw them help people get jobs. Any teenagers, we made sure they finished, um, not me, but my parents made sure they finished high school. It was a lot of community work in that church. Now for me at 25, I had the community piece, but what I didn't have was how important is education, right? Um, this, again, a charismatic husband and wife team um, that I was introduced to, they were educated, they were wealthy, they, were, they spoke with such courage and conviction. It just took, I always say I was, I was, I was, uh, groomed for the brand of religion that I walked into because I saw my parents do it. And here was a step in my mind, a step up from what they had experienced. Um, I was, you know, indoctrinated very young. Um, everything was given to me about what I should believe in, what's important to me, what it means to be a woman, what, um, what it meant to be sexual, which was 
not much at all, honestly. Um, what I should do with my money, the afterlife, everything that was I, that I was to value came through this religious indoctrination. And this new church, this mega church, plugged right in, took the th took things to another level. What was special about this church to me is that the minister was a counselor by education. Um, and we'll get into more about how that unfolded in, into the indoctrination, but that mix of religion and also how to help people change the way they think, it became very dangerous. But at that time, they were talking about things like, you know, communication and marriage, right? Um, again, the value of higher education. Um, these weren't things that we talked about when I was younger. Education was seen, education was looked at as almost dangerous because it's going to make you think. And they just needed us to focus on the word of God. Anything outside of that was dangerous. That's how I was raised. So, you know, my newfound 25 year old religious brain um, kind of was uh, in conflict with what my parents were raised into. They saw me going to places that they hadn't. We grew up with, you know, no earrings. Women didn't wear makeup. You had to wear dresses, that sort of thing. This new church, it felt liberating to me, right? Um, so why did I leave if, if, it, if it felt liberating, if it took me to another level as far as education and confidence, why did I leave? Well, at the same time that it was answering a need, there were so many things intertwined that I missed. Here's one, for example, community work was important. I was raised that way. We did community work in this large church too, but it was different. We would go into these communities uh, mostly low-income communities and soul win. Anybody remember soul winning? Familiar with knocking on people's doors to tell them about Jesus? We would do that unasked. <laughs> you know, no one checked with these people ahead of time. We just interrupted their Saturday morning to tell them about Jesus. And I'm thinking through this logically and saying, first of all, we're in the South. We're in a Black community. These people know about Jesus. I'm not. I'm not here to tell them anything new. That's I mean, that's kind of not everyone, but a large percent of, of Black people in the South know about Jesus. That's just part of life. And that started to feel very arrogant to me. You know, I'm all about community work, but why don't we kind of survey the area and say, hey, what do you need? Right? Or do you need jobs? Can we help with that? Do you need food? Do you need babysitters so you can go to work? Do we need to help car repairs? There were a lot of tangible things that I felt like our church, with all the resources we had, could be providing for this community, not this arrogant, you got to know Jesus the way we say you should know Jesus. It was those sort of things that just kind of started to chip away at what this was about for me. Um, another thing that was really, um, really brought to question for me was my womanhood. Right. This is this is womanhood. This is what it looks like. Your goals are to be married, have children, be a submissive wife. It was a very linear path. And again, I'm unfolding. I'm learning more. And this just wasn't it wasn't all it was cracked up to be for me. And I was meeting other people that that just wasn't their reality. Right. But the indoctrination, the indoctrination, the, the, the rules of the organization was, no, 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 no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter what you're experiencing, you need to get into this box. This is God's way. This is acceptable. This is what Christ said the church should look like. This is what Christ said women should look like. And I just kicked, 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 kicked against that. Um, something else that stuck out to me really uh, in a major way when I started to awaken to things was the tithing. You all familiar with tithing where you give 10% of your income to your church. And I did that religiously. Um, I was raised that way, it wasn't even a, a question. But I struggled to give 10% in my job where my 401k was matched. That's just a weird, <laughs> you know, there's a, this promise of give 10% to your church and God will bless you. But I had a tangible, actual uh, resource that said, you give 10%, you invest 10%, we're going to match it. It was 100, it was guaranteed. But in my religious mind, I couldn't wrap my brain around why that was more secure than this 10% I was giving to, to the church. 
again, I was born into this stuff. This is this this was our reality, right? Um, I started to meet different people. Atlanta, Georgia was a much bigger city than my hometown, Anniston, Alabama. So it gave me an opportunity to meet tons of different kinds of people, different walks of life, different religious beliefs. And I didn't run from it. I welcomed it. One thing that my dad really, um, what I really gleaned from him was the importance of reading. He had a huge library in our den. So he was always reading, always studying. What I learned later is that the books that he read and studied, they kind of reinforce his current belief system, right? So you're not really learning anything. You're just kind of reinforcing, you're getting more ideas, more ways to, to, to grow this very particular brand of faith. I took that love of reading and just expanded it for myself. I want to know some other stuff. I studied religion um, in college. I studied psychology in college. Um, and, and any book I could get my hands on about something else, I just started to just inhale it. And that just burst open in my heart. It burst open in my mind. Like, what am I doing? I didn't think there was another way to be. I came from that, that brand of Christianity that says Jesus is the only way. Right, nothing else was possible. Nothing else was real. Everyone else was going to hell, and I just couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't continue in that path, learning as much as I was learning. So I started to question, and as I started to question, it was very confusing. It was hard. It was scary. Um, there were years of indoctrination for me to 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 unwrap and unravel, and I I did it piece by piece. Um, it was a very lonely journey. Again, all of my family and friends were in the faith. So my conversations were changing and I started to slowly be put on the outskirts of family and friend relationships. Something's happening with her. She's changing. The devil has her. These are things that I would hear. And it was heartbreaking, you know, and there was a moment where I had to decide, am I going to be authentic to who I am? Or I'm just going to play the role because I knew it. I knew the songs. I knew the dance. I knew how to clap and sway. I sang in the choir. I could play the role and no one would know anything different. But me wanting to be 100% as authentic as I could be, I knew I had to just let it go. And I remember sitting at my desk one day at work. And the last prayer that I prayed was, God, if you're real, you're going to have to show me. But I'm not forcing it. I'm not gonna deny the thoughts that I'm having. I'm not gonna deny my curiosity. I'm not gonna run. I'm not gonna deny quote unquote sinful things. Um, I'm gonna explore. And I dove head first and never looked back. And from that moment on, my life was never the same. I started to see a therapist and I mean, it was painful and I needed someone to talk to about this stuff. Again, everyone else thought I was crazy. And I saw a therapist, a beautiful woman in Atlanta, Georgia, and she was a Christian, but she held space for me. At that time, I couldn't find anyone that was not Christian, and I wanted a Black woman to talk to at that time. And it, it was just next to impossible to find. Now, while this woman held space for me and, and heard my story, she never forced me either way. She just gave me a place to talk it slowly dawned on me that I need to be this for some of, some other people. I can't be the only one having these questions. I can't be the only one experiencing the doubt and the, the difficulty of just changing the way you think. I wanna do this. And that's what led me to be a therapist to have a specific focus on religious trauma. Now, when we talk about trauma, um, it's a buzzword. I imagine many of you are familiar with what that means. I'll give you kind of my um, quick um, quick explanation of religious trauma. So when I look at trauma, I think it's the it's it's a too much, too fast, too soon um, can be consistent, can be a, a one time um, impact. But in, in the context of religious trauma, it's usually something consistent, right? You're taught over and over, it's reinforced. And it overwhelms the nervous system, how we think, how we respond, how we perceive. And at every turn, when the body wants to show up for itself to fight, to speak up, you're met with the indoctrination, 
right? Here's an example. Um, maybe I'll talk about sex and sexuality. Maybe I don't fit the mold. Maybe I'm, I, I'm a woman, but I'm attracted to women. Maybe I'm attracted to men and women. Maybe neither. I'm not even interested at all. But the, the teaching was as a woman, you are to marry, you are to have children. This is, this is the call, right? The God of gods has put a call on your life and this is what you're supposed to walk into. So I don't get, but as the indoctrination says, you don't get to think outside of that, right? So any, any um, longings that you may have, silence, right? Any attractions you may have, silence, get back in the box, right? So you're not allowed to show up for yourself. Another one um, is around critical thinking. It's something that um, it, it's a big conversation in my work with my clients. You want to think for yourself. You want to um, come to conclusions about things for yourself. You want to explore. Curiosity is a big one. I, I encourage my clients um, tremendously to just be curious about things and go explore, go find out. Because in that biblical world, it says that you are to bring into subjection anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of the word of God. This is the scripture, right? So if it's not in the Bible, you can't think it. You can't be it. You can't be a part of it. Again, you're silenced, right? So the traumatizing piece is when you come up to a feeling, a thought in and of yourself, you, you bump into people that have a different way of thinking than you do or a different way of living than you do. The, the trauma shows up because it says, here's an indoctrination, don't go there. Don't be friends with these people, right? If anything, they're now, they're now a project for you to bring into the kingdom. Right, big gaps between how to connect with human beings on a real level of, because they everyone, trust me, everyone I met while I was in the faith was a project. Do you know Jesus and how am I going to win you over? But how to connect to people to show genuine interest and curiosity about what they love, what's important to them, what they care about, and how to support them in that. I didn't know how to do it. There were huge gaps in my development and I see it in my clients. You know, um, with heavy religious indoctrinated groups, for example, the caregiver, right? You learn what love is, safety is, and nurturing is in the context of the religious environment. And often, again, another big gap, I look to mom, I look, I look to mom, mom looks to dad, dad looks to God. No one looks at each other. Again, another big break in how we relate to each other. God never really answers. People say it. I've never heard the voice of God. I used to say I did, but I didn't. So this all-knowing, all, all loving being is so distant from me. So how do I love another human being who sits right next to me? How do I love um, a partner that I'm sharing life with? When I've been taught to look up, if there was an argument, I, I was married at um, one point in my Christian life. When I tell you the struggles that I had there, again, I didn't know how to connect. I didn't know how to have basic, um, I shouldn't say basic, thoughtful, meaningful, vulnerable conversations with my ex-husband. I didn't know how to do it. I would run and pray. God changes heart. God fix him, fix me, fix this. But that skill set that's needed to look at a human being and talk and to be open and to be vulnerable, to care about each other, huge gaps in my development in that space. Um, another one is around emotions. There's a scripture that talks about casting down fear. And what I've learned in my work as a therapist, as, as a trauma therapist, that fear is important. It's, an, it's as important as happiness and joy, fear and pain, doubt, there's a, there's, a, there's a wide, beautiful, uh, vast <laughs> human experience around emotions and we get to experience them all, right? We talk about the pursuit of happiness. I always say that we can kind of get ourselves in some sticky situations when we just focus on happiness alone. I think it's important to embrace that. Sometimes I feel happy, but sometimes I feel mad as hell. And that's just as important, it's just as real. But in my religious teaching, I was supposed to have faith and joy and peace because God said so. And if I didn't experience that, then something was wrong with me. I wasn't believing enough. My faith 
wasn't where it needed to be. There was no room for me to have, again, the full gamut of the human experience, the human emotional experience. It stifled my emotions. It limited um, what I was able to experience, what I was able to acknowledge that another person would experience because I was just as judgmental, right? You know? And the same parts of our brain that allows us to experience anger and terror are the same parts of our brain that allow us to experience joy and happiness. But if we're silencing parts of ourselves, we're missing again that rainbow of, of emotional experience. So in con conclusion, I want to chat with you all today. I welcome some questions, but you know, in my work with uh, religious trauma clients, our focus is to, uh, to have awareness on what's happening in our bodies, in our feelings, what we're thinking about, how to connect to these sensations, these emotions, these experiences. We stop pushing things away, right? We get with, we, we reframe language like sin, like what does that mean to you now? You know, what is sin? It doesn't exist in my life, but once upon a time, sin was a big deal, right? It meant heaven or hell for me. It meant all of eternity to me. And the beautiful thing I get to watch my clients walk through is to look at each of these kind of these teachings, these frameworks, we deconstruct them, right? We reframe things. We, 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 we look at what was considered our value system before and what we value now. And sometimes things match up, right? Still love, you know, we still care about community. Um, parents still love children, still value education. But what does that mean in this, this freer experience that we're having? You know, what's real and what's not? Changing our perceptions. We were taught in my religious experience to, um, everything was light and darkness. We're seeing it in our country now. There's a there's a, a battle. If you if you listen to any of the evangelicals, and I do because it's, it's research for me, so I stay, you know, I have a little ear in that area. But it's not really men and women fighting for freedoms and rights in the country. It's a it's a battle in the heavens. It's good versus evil, and what that does is keep people blind. It keeps people very focused on very specific issues. But this work brings us to safety, safety in the body, safety in the mind, safety to connect to others, safety to make, to make room for other people's way of being, way of experiencing life. And a big part of healing, big part of healing is to embrace curiosity, to play, to have pleasure, to feel a full range of emotions. I saw a lot of beautiful things in my faith community growing up and I saw harmful things. And, and I always say that I'm not anti-religion, but I'm anti-harm because I experienced religion in multiple ways. I did experience the harmful pieces, but again, I, I can't throw out that piece that my parents talked to me about when they went from seeing, you know, the black water fountains, the white water fountains, to standing in the hallway at the doctor's office while the white patrons sat comfortably waiting for the doctor to see them. And my black family had to wait in the hallway to see if the doctor wanted to stay a little bit longer to see them. There were real life things happening that they could go to their church and feel seen and loved and safe and protected. The painful, the danger, the harmful thing was the silence that they experienced, right? So it's kind of this dual existence that's happened. And I make room for that. All of my clients, even if they are experiencing religious trauma, they don't necessarily stop believing. They just come to some form of religion, of faith, of ritual for them that makes them feel safe, that makes them feel good, that makes them feel connected. And I make, I leave room for that. The last thing I want to do in my work is to be like, well, I always say I didn't trade one t-shirt for another, right? I didn't trade one jersey for the other team. I'm on team human being and helping people experience it in the most authentic and, and safe and, and joyous way that they can. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sandria. That was such a moving and enlightening presentation. You tell your story in such a beautiful way. Thank you for your presentation today. I try and alternate as best I can between the Zoom community and the in-person community. 
I'll go ahead and start with the first question uh, while we wait for questions to come in. And as a person in a wheelchair, now I grew up in an area that wasn't particularly religious, the Bay Area, and my family wasn't religious. So it was unlikely that I was going to be religious. But as a child, the people that would interact with me, <laughs> the religious people, I was like a magnet to them. And they would pray for me and interact in all kinds of strange ways. And so my question is, either in your uh, Christian life or your coaching life, uh, is the, can you relate to this experience of people with disabilities? Do you hear similar stories like that? Absolutely. And like I mentioned briefly, Todd, it's, it's people weren't people, they were projects, right? So we needed to heal and deliver and you know, it, it, it was never let me see you, let me meet you where you are, how can I support you? Um, or just be seen, hello, right? We're, we're sharing this planet together, how are you? Have a great day. That was too simple, people were projects. And we were, we were <laughs> hell bent <laughs> on bringing Christ to people. We, we thought everyone needed to know. So absolutely, this was, this was a very, um, familiar experience, no matter where people sat in life, it was our job to bring them the healing in the way that we thought they should be. It was a very arrogant way of living, honestly. Thank you. The questions are rolling in. Let's go live to the Friendly House first for a question from our president, Dave DiNucci. Um, yeah, I, I was, I mean, when you told your story, it was, it sounded very much like one-on-one uh, -on -one almost with people facing this transition. Um, our group, um, our mission statement contains the word community. I mean, that's our main thing is a community. And in your case, it sounds like as a counselor, you're trying to provide that perspective, that larger perspective that, that you know, that people transitioning out of out of religion might be able to uh, see. Um, but it sounds like for the most part, you're in a community that's still very largely religious and very largely uh, 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 steeped in all of that stuff that you, you've transitioned out of a little bit. Um, are there communities there that they can find or that you can find that, that you can be speaking with others that are going through the same kinds of things, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, one of the, the, the fears, one of the, the things that is resistant pretty regularly as people question and leave religion is to regroup. Groups are scary now because I don't want to get into a group and then there's this way of thinking and now I can't get out again. It's actually a, a, a source of contention, a, a source of uh, triggering to start to regroup. So I'm really, I don't find groups for people. Maybe if there's something I know that's happening, um, some interest and think, this is what I encourage people to do. What are you interested in? Let's just keep it real simple, right? Um, hiking, find hiking groups, music. Let's start doing concerts, find groups that go and, and enjoy live music. We don't have to have necessarily a belief system around it. It takes time to even connect to humanist groups or atheist groups, because again, groups are scary. So we lean toward interest first. My personal group is, is doesn't lean religious actually. <laughs> um, it's, it's more agnostic. Um, and again, it's, I leave it up to the individual. First and foremost for me is helping that person find safety in their bodies and themselves. And they slowly start to reconnect to themselves and then connect to people in a different way. And people will find groups as they feel comfortable. Um, but I, baseline for me is what are your interests? Let's connect in that way. Um, Black non-believers is, is pretty, uh, a pretty big group. And there are a lot of activities that happen in the Atlanta era specifically. And I partner with them on some things. Um, but anytime I hear of a group that's doing something, I'm happy to share it with my clients. My, my coaching arm of my practice lets me um, meet with people all over the world. So if there's something I can plug people in, I'll do that. 
But again, my, I encourage them to just lean on your interest, um, have fun, play, enjoy life, be curious. And as you want to, as you're ready to connect to larger groups and do so, but it's, it's a slow walk to regroup again. Let's go to our Zoom community. Suzanne is prominently displayed with her hand up. Suzanne, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sue Andrea. I hope I said your name right. I don't know if I did or not. <clears throat> but um, I wanted to uh, express, a, I like the way that you were saying, and if I got this right, so that you don't really want to criticize religion, but you want to show or to point out the harm that religion brings. And because you know there's a lot of good people and these are endeared members of your family. And I think that's a really important thing as to, to how to how to separate, you know, because religion does a lot of bad it's harm. It's it's mm. it's really bad. And so how to, you know, not uh, separate your life from that, from those people that are connected to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I like that approach. And I think that's kind of the way we have to live today because there's people's ideologies we don't like either and they're harmful. So um, um, I appreciate that slant that you gave. So do you have anything more to say about that? You know, when I first started my exodus <laughs> from religion i hated it so this getting to not being anti-religion but anti-harm it's been a journey for me personally i all i saw was the harm i felt like my life had been um stolen like i spent so much time and energy and money in a way of thinking and felt like i could be so much further along in my life so there was a lot of anger so i meet clients there and they are in that very angry space and again, it's, it's, it's up to the individual to land where they land. I don't tell people how they should think. Um, but in my personal journey, I remember traveling. I was in um, Thailand and wanted to visit a temple because I'm interested in religion. And for me to walk into a church in my hometown felt enormously painful. Me, for me to walk into a church, in, I mean, a temple in... Um, um, Thailand felt beautiful and I thought it was just an amazing cultural experience and what that said to me is I'm going to have we my clients people questioning religion leaving religion we're going to have a very specific relationship with our brand of religion the experience we had so while I had this hate for the Christianity that I was brought up in I had a respect for this, this level of um, religious expression in another country, another language, the art, it was just beautiful to me. And that was part of my healing to say, okay, what's really happening here? Is it all bad? Or is there something that, again, brings people together? It unites around art and culture, you know, food and music. And again, I look at my parents and I, I can't, deny them the safety that they felt at such a painful time in the world, in America. There was something positive there. What's that saying? You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, why would we do that? But <laughs> it, it's looking at things logically, right? And I, I feel like whenever we start to say yeah. all of something, we're getting into a sticky place. Let's stay in the Zoom community and go to Joyce with a question. Um, in, in our community, I think we often look at a healthy life as being completely free of religion. And we've, we've rejected that, and so that's fine. But um, you've commented on people who maybe changed their framework but stayed within religion. And I'm wondering how, if you could give an example of how you changed the framework. Would it be sim similar? to moving from a fundamentalist church to a progressive church where the emphasis is on love and that sort of thing? You, you said it exactly, Joyce. That's a great example where it's, what is this church um, or religion's focus, right? Is it the indoctrination? Is it the silencing? Is it the, you gotta fit into this box to be loved and to be welcomed here versus, wait, there's room for me and there's room for people and we're trying to push 
our focus is love and how we walk that love out looks different. And I've seen that happen for people and it works for them. Who am I to say what's healthy or not for them? Now, if even as they kind of make this shift, they're testing the waters, they're openly critiquing, right? It's they're experiencing experience experiencing it from a different perspective as well. Right. And at any time they can leave. Yeah. Right? They're not, it's not heaven and hell. You have to do this, that, that, that feeling, that requirement, that kind of experience is gone. So they're doing it in a, in a free way. Sometimes it's not necessarily religion. It may be a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned rituals, right? These things may not be connected to a um, God per se, but a connection with people, connection with animals, connection with the earth, something that makes people feel like I'm not, there's something bigger than me. What you said really struck you really struck a note when you said you can leave in other mm -hmm. words this is, this is no longer cult like absolutely. this is choice like thank you absolutely there's a freedom there sure yeah let's stay in the zoom community and go to a question from our immediate past president mr wayne harris hi thanks for being here today and my question is in your uh, practice or your uh coaching what's the percentage of whites versus blacks that you teach I lean heavy white. Do you really? Well, yeah. what percent do you think? Um, probably 80%. Mm -hmm. And what are their main reasons that when they come to you with the, for leaving the uh, church? My white clients or black clients? Are yeah, the, white, white. White. Um, much of the same, the, the boxes that they must fit in, um, who to love, how to love, what to do with money, what to do with time, um, lots of fear, um, struggling to make decisions and, and realizing, whoa, I have to check in with God or a leader. I, I, I'm a full grown adult, but I'm struggling with decision making and trusting myself. A lot of that. And I tell you over the past, you know, couple years here in our country, it's been a wave because people are sitting in churches saying, wait a minute, I didn't know we were supposed to be racist. I didn't know we were supposed to be elitist. That's not what I signed up for. And these things are kind of coming up in a new way in a very <laughs> out in front. And people are grappling with that and their hearts are breaking. You know, a lot of them came to Jesus because they thought it was about love. And they're seeing that that's not really the case. They've been sold a bill of goods that, that, that isn't, cracked, isn't what it was cracked up to be. And what's the age range that you normally work with? Um, it's pretty broad, but I think the heavy concentration is probably 30s, 40s. We'll stay in the Zoom community and go to a question from the humanist with a, an ironic name, Mr. Al Christians. Yes, uh, you're telling your people to think for themselves. Uh, you know, the humanists were founded by a group of mostly of preachers who uh, thought that religion had kind of was not kind of serving the right purpose and that that we needed new ideas. Um, and when you have people thinking for themselves, have they turned up any good new religious ideas for you that you could share with us? Uh, any any new approaches? You know, I'm I'm influenced by uh, Kurt Vonnegut and Martin Gardner, who uh, are had did a lot of religious thinking, but they somehow managed to separate religion from belief. They were religious, but their religion didn't include belief. Uh, what other kinds of things can people do to to come up with new approaches to to religion? Or are you, you have some ideas you could share with us? No one's mentioned to me about a new kind of theory or, or practice. Um, uh, honestly, sometimes they go back even further to what was the foundation of this? What was the original intent? Um, what comes to mind is the the womanist movement. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but it's, it's it's black women theology approach where they're looking at the Bible in a different way. Um, they're they're highlighting stories that hadn't been highlighted before. They're finding themselves in these scriptures that make them feel empowered. So it's not sometimes it's not a new book for them, but it's a new way of reading it. You know, sometimes you just look at the, for example, the book of Psalms and people find peace and joy in that poetry. 
maybe they don't get into the heaven and hell and people are killing people and you know you, you kind of with that freedom with that freedom to think that means I can I can choose from this book what I want and any other book and create what feels right for me for my life we don't have to unless you choose it you don't have to throw away our books right a book is a book is a book we just stop giving it that power that it used to have I'll read a question from our Zoom community from Preston Sue and Donna Shaver uh, sharing a screen there. And I think they're asking you as well as maybe in your coaching and experience, if you leave the confines of a restrictive religion, do you get cut off from your family? I went through it myself. Um, so my father, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad pastored, um, my uncles, my aunties, my brother, cousins, I mean, pastors, preachers, prophets, listen, <laughs> we, we run the gamut. And so I'm a bit of a black sheep in the family, right? And lots of distance was created when I started to talk about my newfound thinking and that I didn't believe anymore. I hid it for a long time. Cause I needed to feel safe in myself. I knew I, I didn't feel safe with my family either. Cause I knew they were going to tell me, you, you know, how, you know, I always say the context that sends us back to our abusers are usually religion and family, right? The dirty uncle that, that touched the kids, but he gets, still gets to sit at the table. Right. And I felt like to talk to my family about the pain I was experiencing, the shifts I was experiencing, they were sending me back to the abuser. So I had to find safety for myself. And we probably both disconnected. As I felt safer, I wanted to spend more time with my family. I wanted to connect, I think, like I mentioned earlier, around basic things. I'm a mom now. I want to talk about my kid and you know, simple things, life things. But because I come from a, a religious family, everything's about the word everything and it was just impossible to be together with with a lot of them so there is a lot of distance and i find people quite often creating chosen families right sometimes people don't want to change they don't want to make room for your new way of being so we have to find other safe places so unfortunately it, it is a part of the experience for many a question from our Zoom community from one of our newest members, Mr. John Tellia. Uh, first of all, loved, loved your talk. So I'm a former Lutheran pastor. I was ordained in the Lutheran church for seven years. Over the last year, um, I have begun this crazy journey called humanism and loved it. And this week I was actually got my approval for endorsement as a secular humanist hospice chaplain. Mm -hmm. Um which was awesome. And I'm the only uh, secular hospice chaplain we have in our, in our area. Um, one thing that I continue to struggle with and I've, I've sought counseling for, for religious trauma is setting boundaries and how do I live my authentic self, self while at, at the same time, not expecting those, my family, my, my brother is a very conservative um, Christian pastor, pastor, uh, not expecting them to change. Like I've changed. That's my story. And so I would love to hear um, how you work with individuals about setting those boundaries, you know, setting that like, this is me and I, I love my authentic self and I want to be my authentic self around you. But I understand that my biological family, they haven't done that journey. So um, how do you set those boundaries in a, in a life-giving way instead of um, use, utilizing emotional cutoff. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, congratulations to you, John, on being the first secular chaplain. It took everything I had to, to use the secular title. That was very, that was a big shift for me. It says something to the world, right? So congratulations. Um, these religious organizations exist within a codependent way of being like we are the same we can't be without each other you start to branch off and you're wrong they they thrive in codependency so anything that looks like autonomy independence um boundaries that's resisted you don't get to do that right so the way i look at boundaries and the way i explain it to my clients is boundaries say who you are and who you are not 
boundaries are a way to connect us in a way that's safe and healthy for everyone, right? So there, you know, sometimes people think boundaries are, like you said, the cutoff. We don't, we can't be together. That's not the point of a boundary. The boundary is saying, we can come to, here's my fence. We can come and hang out here all day. But the minute you start to jump over here and do some things that I've already stated, that's not safe for me, right? Neither am I going to jump over into your yard to say, you shouldn't be doing that, right? Um, now, there can be times when you see harm, right? If there's harm being caused to people that we need to step up. Right, that's 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 your boundary, and that's my call as a human being. If I see danger, and I need to protect the child, protect the person, I'm going to answer that call. But a boundary, in essence, is to bring us closer. So you find ways that you connect. And I mentioned it earlier. What are the hobbies? How are the kids? What are we doing? Um, we're going to Six Flags this year. I don't know. We're, you know what I'm saying? Like just basic, foundational, human, life-giving things that we can connect on. That's my focus when I'm with my family. Now, if they start to cross the boundary with me to say, hey, you need to come back to the, I'm very clear. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to love. We can hang out, but I will not be judged. I will not be bullied. I will stay here as long as I feel safe. And that's freedom because that says, if you want me around, there's some limits here. And it's, the same is true for me. If I want to be around, there's some limits. I'm not going to come in and say, hey, all y'all are stupid. That's not fair, right? So I, my boundary hat says, it's who, it says who I am and who I am not. And it says how we can be together. You see that tilt more on how can we be together versus I'm shutting everyone out. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's stay in the Zoom community and take a question from another one of our very talented MCs, Miss Helen Christians. Um, first of all, just a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Very, very much appreciated. Um, you mentioned you have a child and so much with uh, uh, religion, um, the rituals of coming of age, the baptism, the first communion, the confirmation. I, I was raised Catholic and they really are celebrations of families. Um, our daughter was baptized, but that, then we kind of moved away from those traditions. And um, but we also live far away from our families. So, how have you handled as a family uh, the fact with a child um, these coming of age rituals and your relationship between grandparents and and your child? How how are you handling? We create rituals, um, routines as we go. Um, you know, it used to be once upon a time, Christmas meant mom's house. We're going to church. We're going to, you know, baby Jesus, the speeches, all of that. That's not a part of our life anymore. But what we do is where are we going to go and travel for Christmas this year? These are our routines. What's Christmas about for us? It's just fun. We do some gift giving. We do some giving to the, to those in need. You know, it's back to what are my values, and these are the values I want to hand down to my daughter and my mom, my brother, my family. They can participate as much as they want, right? And I can participate with them as much as I want. It's back to that boundary line, like, like what feels safe, what helps us connect, and if we start to reach pieces that 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 create a wedge, that's where I draw the line. Um, it's funny, my, my daughter, she sometimes hangs out with my grand, her mom, my mom, grandma, and my mom still goes to church and she's gone to church with her a couple of times. And my own, my boundary has been, she can go. I don't want her to not know what's happening in the world, right? I feel like that's just another brand of ignorance. This is what her grandma does. She's gone to church with her. And my boundary line has been, do not make her pray. Do not make her confess Christ. Don't force her into anything. And my mom has held that line. That's fine with me. One of the things I always say when we, when we leave it, one question that I ask my clients is, what part of it do you want to bring with you? What was, what was valuable there? What was um, helped you connect to, again, what's valuable to you that you want to bring forward? For me, one of them is gospel music. It still moves me, right? I Not all of it, some of it is just like, I can't even sing that, that's just way too much. But there's something there. And again, it's it's probably, not probably, I know it's from my 
um, African American heritage and the music that came out of enslaved people who needed a way. And here's the thing with trauma, part of the healing is letting the body feel letting the body move. So the dancing and the singing, there's something healing in that beyond God and spirituality. This is science and there's study there. And I bring that with me. So my daughter, knowing that music, that's important to me. Does she have to adopt it as a belief system? No. And there are times when she says, I don't want to go to church, mommy. It's boring. And you have to go, babe. We're going to the park. I try not to make it um, just this big monster of a thing. It's just a way that people are choosing to live. And you can choose any way to live that you want. Before she chooses anything, I want her to have information and experience. You touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but I'd like to hear more. There are a few examples of progressive religious leaders like William Barber and a few others, but in general, religion seems to be uh, uh, more limiting and uh, rules-based and it's be becoming more and more Republicans are associated with fanatical religion and Democrats are the free thinkers. And so what role do you think or how can, um, how do we deal with this religious disconnect or is this a off-base question on my part? I think it's a valid question. Um, I don't have an answer. For, for where people stand politically. Um, I see that shift, right? Not even a shift. I see that coming to light what has been at work for a very long time. I read a, a book recently called White Evangelicalism by Athena Butler. Fascinating book. And I mean, she walks the line from um, America, chattel slavery to now and what has been in play in, in, at work for so long. Um, I, I think education is a big piece, right? We, we lean into our faith as religious people, lean into the faith and that's so important and we're missing, like I said in my own story, I was so focused on the safety that that community provided for me that I missed what was being woven in, right? The limiting, uh, the whitewashing, the, I mean, there were so many things that were damaging to me as a woman, as a black woman. And I had to come to terms with that. And that's hard for people to do, right? There's so much love there, but there's some, there's some really dark, um, dangerous things happening there. So I'm a, I'm a proponent of education, right? Outside of your religious books, you have to read, you have to educate yourself. Um, Let's go to the friendly house for a question from our very talented camera person, Mr. Mike Bruchet. Well, speaking is not exactly one of my talents, but <laughs> um, now, in my observation, um, a lot of hardcore fundamentalist religions and also uh, communist regimes and other secular totalitarian regimes have something in common is that they all have their followers focus on the bright, shining ideal, or as I call it, BSI. But anyway, um, do you have any connection with people, with uh, therapists or counselors uh, who handle other religions like um, Islam or um, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, our community is not that large, right? It's uh... It's a very still kind of a niche area because um, you have to you have to acknowledge that there is harm in religion to even connect the trauma to it, right? We, I think what's what we see more often is kind of um, what we saw happening in Utah and in Texas with those religious groups. I think everyone kind of agrees, oh, that's a cult, right? But here we are in America, and it's almost 90 something percent of people that believe in God. So it's such a fine line for people to even say that there's harm there. So the group is still small as far as clinicians are concerned. Um, but there's a religious trauma institute, great resource of um, uh, therapists and counselors there. Um, and yeah, I have uh, Jewish colleagues, I have um, uh, folks that have left Islam, it's, it's a growing community. So absolutely. Christianity was just my brand, but yeah, there's resources for, for various, various types of experiences. Yeah. From my own past experience, I'm an ex-Catholic myself and I just let that faith rot away from me. 
Um, I think that what I did as a young or the beginning of my adulthood when I left religion is I started paying attention to how my own behavior affects other people. And I was becoming a better person in my own conduct. And then as I gained more confidence in myself and who I am, I decided to shop around uh, for what I would join. And here I am in it right now, the humanist of greater Portland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if, if this resonates with you, I remember having to be right, right? Part of my teaching was you have the word, you have, you know, all knowing because of God, you have to be right. And there was such humility in saying, no, I'm not. I don't know these things. I don't know these people. And again, I allow curiosity to show up first. Hi, how are you? What's important to you? And, and sitting with that, allowing another perspective, another uh, point of view to be present in the room. Right, just shut up. <laughs> you don't know everything, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I found a lot more freedom just not knowing, knowing that I don't know everything. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We could probably talk for hours, but I better get there. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Joyce had a request in chat that I will answer, and Sandria, if I get it wrong, uh, go ahead and, and jump in there. But she asked for the author again of Right Evangelicalism. And I believe you said Athena Butler? Yep, Athena Butler. Okay, and then Joyce had a question that she typed in all capital letters with her name. She's very excited about this question. Go ahead, Joyce. <laughs> all right. Um, I think you mentioned that you have uh, perhaps not joined a humanist group, but had experience with humanists. And Mike, um, you're making me think as we talk about people analyzing their own um, journey whether those uh, um those humanists whether we have looked inside ourselves enough in other words have you found that need to be right among humanists as well as among religious people i i think you know this experience is ever evolving i think there's always opportunity for us to take a look at what we're thinking and believing in. Are we pushing anyone out or leaving anyone out? Is there something that we're hinged on so dogmatically that could still be causing harm or exclusion? There's always opportunity for that. I, I you know, I for me too, right? Always an opportunity. Let's go to the friendly house for another question from Dave Danucci. Uh, sometimes humanism is tightly <clears throat> coupled to critical thinking and stuff like that. So there's a whole other branch of not only, you know, how are we helping you to find another community or, or uh, uh, like yourself in this new, this new mindset or whatever, but new tools to kind of look at the world, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> and the, and, you know, one, one thing I've wondered for a long time um, is, whether religion kind of the the whole training of religion to kind of just just believe this regardless of whether there's data to support it or whatever just believe that and then when you leave that behind maybe that automatically starts giving you a place where you can start seeing the world more clearly and start reasoning more clearly etc um so do you do you also get into all of that critical thinking stuff with your clients and 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 that that whole new way of seeing the world? Absolutely. That's a big piece of of the healing journey. Um it's it's a tool, right? That you now you have the freedom. Sometimes I always say who gives you permission? Who are you waiting on to say this is okay for you or not okay? for you and just that piece in and of itself is a is a pause for my clients to say oh wait a minute I don't have to ask any anyone else for this right I can go find it I can be curious I can um, find some enjoyment in uh, like this uh, I think it was Mike said earlier in not knowing that's okay but yeah the critical thinking is a huge part of the healing journey and someone kept Renee Elias has had his hand up for so long. And he's waving. And I saw him go, ah. Oh. You're pretty, you're smart, you're brave, and you're uh, open to the world at large in spite of 
the ma the madness out there uh, against the black people as a as a people. My comment is this: as somebody raised an Orthodox Jew, I'm Sephardic Jew, and who loved, like you said, you loved the singing, uh, the gospel singing, and I missed. Uh, you know, in an Orthodox uh, temple, it's a men's club. The women are upstairs. They're, they're unclean, maybe. They're having their period. You know, all of that. My mother couldn't go to my father's burial because she may be unclean. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the kind of frame of reference that I worked off. Well, after being married to a woman who is a very, you'd get along with her beautifully, I changed my way of thinking. But I still have a need for some, I'm a pantheist some belief that in something beyond me. But here's my story. And, and then my question will follow. Here I am in the, in the army, I'm 19 during the Korean War and I'm getting trained to go fight. And I'm on line at the channel line and a guy comes online who I know, who just came from church. He has a master's degree in English. And he says to me, why did you kill Christ? I said, I'm not gonna use his name because he may, I said, look, I wasn't there, I don't know. And I said, besides, how do you kill a deity? If, if that didn't happen, I don't think Christianity would have surfaced. I, I don't know where, where it would take us. So that kind of thing surfaced many, many times in a religious environment. My question to you is, I actually blame the church for promoting the seeds of anti-Semitism because you gotta have somebody to hate or dislike you got to be against something to be for something. Now, my question to you is, has the black, I don't get the feeling that the same thing occurred in the black churches. I don't get that feeling. But I'm guessing that they felt that the Jews were really anathema. We really had no right to claim equality with the rest of the human race because of what we did to Jesus. Presumably, you know, assuming that indeed happened. Uh, I don't know if I was clear, or is it more than I? <laughs> I think it's a weighty question. And, and I mean, I can speak as a black woman, obviously I can't speak for the entire black community. Um, from my experience, just me personally, that's not even a conversation that comes up. Hmm. You know, I was taught that Jesus was Jewish and, you know, it was the Pharisees. It was, you know, the bad people that killed him. It didn't, it had nothing to do with all Jewish people. That's not the experience I've had. That's not the, the education I ever received in my black Christian experience. I can't say that is true for everyone. Right, right. But that's, it's more focused on good versus evil and the goodness can come in any kind of, we are an oppressed people. So there's a level of, of this that doesn't say oppression against others is okay. We've experienced that. And, you know, as, as a descendant of chattel slavery, the Christian experience was to find hope, to find freedom, right. to find um, joy and, and to make sense of the struggle. Right. So it's more locking arms with those with str that struggle versus you know, right. that, was, that was my experience. So let me end by saying this quick anecdote. I'm a retired pathologist, so I, I did autopsies. And, and I always go to this metaphor with people who are trying to make these distinctions between black, white, Muslim. And I said, look, there are 10 bodies laid out there. There's a Muslim, there, there's a black, there's a Native American, there's a Jew, there's a Christian, there is, you name it, okay. But they're all open. You're not seeing the outer layer. You're just seeing the inside. And I'm going to tell you what's there, but you're going to guess by looking what's there. And I guarantee you, you're going to fail. Even if you got five right, I'd say you passed. You won't even get five right. Why? No difference. You'll take that guy's kidney out if he's pink, if you need that kidney and it matches. You'll take that person's heart in this day and age if it matches, because it's gonna keep you going. Where do we make the jump from the reality of biology and science and a complete disbelief in science and medicine to saying that we're promoting evil ideas? Is that 
out of the box thinking that you are referring to? I think it's a portion of it, but I, I think what I think what's happening is is the socialization that we're experiencing. Even if those bodies on the table are the same, society says different and it's at work in our society and people are pained and mistreated and judged and put in boxes because of that socialization. That's the bigger fight. It's less about the, the skin color, the hue in and of itself. It's what society has said is right or wrong or good or bad or better and greater. All right. No, thank you so much. You're very astute. Keep up the good work. Uh, feel good that you're making the world a better place in your own little niche. And uh, let's hope things will get better. Let's hope. Thank you. Yeah. The questions are rolling in at the end here, Sandria. I'll read a question from Nada and then we'll close out with Helen. Nada writes, I'm curious about why you think there are more whites seeking your help. And also are there different challenges for whites, blacks, and others? It's, it's back to my parents' experience. And I go further back than that. When you have a people that were, first of all, very deeply, deeply spiritual, right? We can go back to the continent of Africa and look at cultures there, tribes there, deeply spiritual people. So that's a part of the makeup. Add to that what's happened in America, the history of chattel slavery. And again, what makes us feel safe? What's been the answer to get us through? such a difficult, heinous experience, and it was faith. Now that faith was, gosh, I watched a beautiful documentary about the, the Yoruba, Yoruba tribe, and they talked about how Christianity was forced on the tribe in um, North America, but they would rename their gods so as they attended church and it looked like they were worshiping Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, in their hearts, there was a secret happening. And they said, that's not what this means to us. It was a reframing. Now, whether that's good or bad or, or you know, what I would choose for myself, I think that's so important, that reframing that happens, right? So when I look at African Americans in our country and, and why my clients lean white versus black, even though I've lived that harm and I know it and I so badly <laughs> want them to experience the freedom that I have, I understand it. It's bigger than Jesus. It's connected almost to blackness in America. Again, it's, it's community. Um, these were places where civil rights leaders congregated and planned. You know, the Underground Railroad stops were in churches that people hid in the floors. It's a bigger connection. So walking away, you almost feel like you're walking away from so much of the history and it doesn't feel fair, right? So there's just so many, there's so much at play there. That's a beautiful answer. Let's close out our question and answer period with Helen Christians. It's um, this, this question comes from Joyce's comment about humanism. And one of the slogans of, I think it's almost their mission statement, which I find very troubling, is um, good without God. And I find that, I'll be honest, I find it offensive. Uh, because we're so much more, humanists are so much more. And, and it's like giving power over to say, I'm good without God. And it crosses that line that you're talking about, that boundary, where you're pushing it in someone's face instead of giving them a chance to learn more about us. Um, do you have a thought about that? And I, I, I please feel free to say, no, I don't. <laughs> you know, But I'd really appreciate your thought on that about does that push into someone that's boundary that feels good about God? Because I, God is the idea when I was a child, God helped me a lot, that idea.
that resonates with me for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but there, there is, there is something there. I, I forget the author. Someone here probably knows, but it was we were talking. To, the author was talking about God and what that meant, and went back to God being uh, a group of letters, yeah. each having a sound. We gave meaning to it. That could mean anything. You know, right. it's back to I, I, my black experience with God, my American experience with God, the experience I'm having now as I travel and, and experience quote unquote God in other cultures is just so much bigger right. than my single experience. And I, I think that's we have room there to explore. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what the answer is, I don't know what the change should no. be. But I, it resonates with me that, hmm. Yeah. And that um, I'm against the supernatural idea that, that this, you know, if I pray, it'll fix things. Right. Or the lack of freedom. Yeah. Right. As a medical person, it, you know, God's prayers were answered. Well, yeah, uh, the cancer was cured, but it took a surgeon and an oncologist and uh, mm -hmm. it's a support system. And, uh, and so, but that whole idea of just, Neg negative there's some there's some power in this the the re of, of the good there's like you said there's some goodness in religion and uh that should be i feel it should be respected the goodness that can be found there thank you for a wonderful presentation you you really knocked it out of the ballpark <laughs> well so much I, thank you for having me this is a wonderful conversation i appreciate it so much Sandra, this was an incredible hour and a half that you spent with us, and I will remember this presentation for a long time. Thank you so much for your time and your insight today. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate you all.